Okay, hi. Here we go. Adventures Beyond Nut Mouse Hall with Tum Tum and Nutmeg, and we are on chapter three. Mm -hmm. The nut mouses became regular visitors to the attic and thought of more and more things to do. Tum Tum bought a bag of cement and used it to seal up all the little cracks in the attic window panes. And he climbed up onto the roof and patched the leak with a big roll of linoleum, which he'd stripped out of one of the bathrooms in Nut Mouse Hall. Nutmeg polished Arthur's train set and mopped the children's shoes, and she spent one entire night sorting out their sock drawer. She also left tiny presents under their pillows, silver candlesticks from her banqueting hall and bars of chocolate the size of raisins. Can you picture what that would be like if every morning you woke up and something magical had happened in the night? Day after day, the children woke up to discover some new delight. Lucy was most pleased about the tidying and the mending and Arthur was most pleased about the presents, but they were both equally mystified. It's a mystery. Lucy, who was the eldest, said there must be a fairy in the house, but Arthur had given up believing in fairies long ago, and he wasn't at all convinced. And then one day, he opened his pencil case and found that all of his pencils had been sharpened in a most peculiar way. They looked as though they'd been nibbled. Well, that can't have been done by a fairy. He thought a fairy would have small, delicate teeth, not sharp, spiky ones that could nibble graphite. Later that week, another strange thing happened. On Friday afternoon, one of Arthur's teeth fell out, and before going to bed, he put it on the dresser, thinking he'd find somewhere to hide it away next day. But when he woke up, the tooth had been gone. In its place, there was a tin the size of a penny, and inside was a cake covered with white icing and walnuts, the tiniest cake either child had ever seen. Well, that means it must be a tooth fairy, Lucy said firmly. Only tooth fairies take te teeth away. But tooth fairies leave money, not cakes, Arthur said. The tooth fairy had never come for him before, but it came for his friends, and he knew that they usually got at least 50 pence and sometimes more. Remember, this is taking place in, um, in England. Oh, sorry, something's happening on my screen. There we go. This is taking place in England, um, and they don't have pennies, right? They have a different kind of money, and so um, 50 pence is how much his friends get. Okay, here's the picture of what's happening. That must be the cake that Arthur is receiving from the fairy. Uh, let's see, he corrected himself. Or, or whatever it is, it comes all the time. In truth, neither child knew what to think. If it wasn't a fairy, then what if it was a ghost? But that was such a frightening op option that neither of them liked to suggest it. Eventually, Lucy proposed doing something decisive. I think we should write whoever it is a letter asking them over for a visit, she said. But what if it's a, uh, what if it's a, like, you know, something funny, Arthur asked nervously. The thought of confronting their mysterious visitor face to face made his stomach feel quite hollow. Well, whatever it is, it would be better than no, Lucy said. Arthur wasn't so sure, but he didn't want Lucy thinking he was frightened, so he reluctantly agreed. If you are reluctant, that means you're not convinced, you're not like all for it, you're a little bit wary, a little bit nervous about it. Lucy went to her desk and tore out a sheet of paper from a workbook and then after some deliberation, some thinking it over, deliberation, she and Arthur composed the following message. To whoever has been visiting us, thank you very much for everything you have done. If you are a fairy and not a ghost, then would you like to come and have tea with us here in the attic tomorrow? Love, Arthur and Lucy Mildew, P.S. Please come at four o'clock. Lucy folded the piece of paper in half and addressed one side to the visitor, the attic, Rose Cottage, and then she left it propped up against the mirror on the dresser. Arthur felt anxious all day. Something told him that their visitor might not be at all like the fairies he'd seen in the pictures in Lucy's books. So here is, I like it in stories where they make the, the font, that's the, the way the writing looks, the way the letters work, they make it different, you know, for a letter. This is the letter. And then here is that little symbol again, telling us that we're gonna change like time or place for the next part of the story. We're still in the same chapter, but there's a little pause. The Nut Mouses discovered the letter that night and dragged it back to Nut Mouse Hall. They sat a long while in their kitchen with it spread out in front of them all over the table, wondering what to do. Nutmeg longed to accept, but Tum Tum forbade it. You certainly can't go, Nutmeg, he said firmly. Imagine what a shock it would be for them to find that their visitor was a mouse. Forlornly, sadly, 
Nutmeg agreed. Humans could be so frosty towards mice. There was simply too much misunderstanding between the two species. And what if the children told Mr. Mildew about them? There was no knowing how he'd react. He might try to evict them from their home, make them leave their house. Even though the Nutmouse family had been living in Rose Cottage much longer than the Mildews had. But there was another reason why Nutmeg couldn't introduce herself, and that was because conversation would be impossible. For mice have such tiny voices that the human ear can't pick up a word they say. Even when a mouse is shouting and bellowing at the top of his voice, a human only hears a faint squeal. But Tum Tum had an idea. You must certainly tell them that you're a fairy and not a ghost, for otherwise they might get frightened, he said. But say that you can't accept their invitation because fairies aren't allowed to be seen by humans. And if they are seen, their magic powers stop working. I'm sure they'll understand that. Nutmeg agreed that this was a sensible solution. So she found a big piece of blotting paper, mouse writing paper would have been too small. And in much larger handwriting than she normally used, she wrote the following reply. So now we have another it looks different from the rest of the writing. It's italicized, which means it's all slanty. It's in italics, so it's all slanty. Here's the letter. My dear Arthur and Lucy, I am a fairy of sorts, but sadly I cannot accept your kind invitation because my magic powers would fade if, I were, if you were ever to set eyes on me. But if there's anything more I can do for you, then just leave me another note on the dresser. Love! And she was about to sign herself Mrs. Nutmouse, but she hesitated, thinking it sounded too mousy. <laughs> so instead, she put Nutmeg, which was much more the sort of name a fairy might have. And then on Tum Tum's advice, she added a postscript. A postscript is, means, post means after, and script means writing. So after the writing, she added a postscript, and a postscript, sometimes you write P.S. So she has a P.S., you see that there? P.S. It is best not to tell anyone else about me because that would make my magic powers fade too. She folded the letter into an envelope, which she addressed to Arthur and Lucy Mildew, the attic, Rose Cottage, and then before having his back, Tum Tum delivered it for her, tiptoeing back upstairs to leave it on the dresser, leaning against the handle of Lucy's hairbrush. When Lucy first, oh, there's another pause. So we're gonna change time or place. When Lucy first picked up the brush the next morning, she didn't see the note, but then she noticed a tiny piece of paper fluttering to the floor. Nutmeg's writing was very wobbly, like a drunken spider, Tum Tum always said, but Lucy managed to decipher it using Arthur's magnifying glass. I wonder what a fairy of sorts looks like, Arthur said when she had read it out loud. A fairy of sorts didn't sound nearly as frightening as a ghost. In fact, it sounded rather nice. But even so, he felt relieved that he wouldn't actually have to meet Nutmeg, for he still felt a little unsure about her. But Lucy was longing to meet her. I wonder where fairies of sorts live, she said wonderingly, and she felt very frustrated to think that she might never find out. But as she went to hide the letter in the drawer of her bedside table, where she put all of her most important things, something about the dollhouse caught her eye. She knelt down to look more closely. Here is the next picture and they are looking inside the dollhouse. It's from the perspective of the dollhouse, right? From the view of the dollhouse. She hadn't played with it for a whole week and now everything seemed different. The door knocker had been polished and inside lots of things had been meddled with. The piano lid was open and the kitchen sink was full of water. There were dishes on the draining board and there was a tiny pair of pink slippers beside the bed upstairs. Lucy felt a sudden thrill. Arthur, she said urgently, nutmeg has moved in. The nutmouses hadn't really moved in, of course, because they had a very grand home of their own, but they looked on the dollhouse as a bit of an adventure, a bit of an adventure, and as the days passed, they had become much bolder about making use of it. When they had been working, especially late in the attic, they sometimes spent the night there despite Tum Tum's initial concerns. And so when the children scrutinized each room in turn, if you scrutinize something, you're really looking carefully, you're looking deeply, really analyzing it. When the children scrutinized each room in turn, they noticed all Nutmeg's efforts to make it more homey. There were new gingham curtains on the in the kitchen. Gingham is when there's it's like a pattern 
And oftentimes it's red and white checks, red and white, red and white, red and white, or blue and white, blue and white, blue and white. Um, new gingham curtains in the kitchen and new cushions on the living room sofa. And there was a, and there were soft white towels in the bathroom. There were also hairs on the pillows in the bedroom, gray on one side of the bed and brown on the other. She's got funny hair, Lucy said. It looks a bit mousy. Arthur did not comment. He never noticed what people's hair was like. But when he saw how nice and cozy the fairy of sorts had made the dollhouse, his fears about her at once evaporated. She seemed almost human. We should leave and not make something to eat, he said. If she can't visit with us, then we might as well leave her a snack in the dollhouse. Lucy agreed, and so after supper, they waited until their father had disappeared to his study and then salvaged the last bit of shortbread from the cookie jar and crumbled part of it on one of the little plates in the dollhouse kitchen. They poured a teaspoonful of milk into one of the jugs and laid a place at the table. They even supplied a tiny napkin cut out of a cotton handkerchief. The mildews never used napkins themselves, but Lucy thought nutmeg might appreciate one. The next morning, a sh the shortbread and milk had gone, and there was a letter on the table in the dollhouse kitchen. Lucy picked up the magnifying glass and read it out loud. Oh, it's more italicized writing in italics, so slanty. Dear Arthur and Lucy, thank you for a most magnificent feast. Your shortbread was superb and I ate much more than I should have. I must acquire the recipe one day. I hope you do not mind me making use of your dollhouse, but it is very convenient to have somewhere to leave my things. Love, Nutmeg. After that, Arthur and Lucy agreed that they should leave Nutmeg something to eat every night, and they both agreed that life was much, much more interesting now that they had a fairy of sorts looking after them. In chapter four, I'll show you a picture. Ooh, this picture makes me think. Bum, bum, bum. What do you think about that character? Based on the illustration, do you think she is kind and lovely and easygoing and fun? Hmm. Hmm. To be continued. <laughs>